<laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, I'm going to continue with the study of the book of Proverbs today. Uh, last uh, Wednesday, uh, I got halfway through chapter 10, and I'm going to pick up where I left off. Uh, I call this Wisdom Wednesdays because each Wednesday we uh, discuss more and more Proverbs. There's 31 chapters. We're on chapter 10, so there's quite a ways left to go. If you haven't seen the first uh, nine chapters, uh, they're already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so I invite you to go back and watch those. Um, so picking up with uh, Proverbs chapter 10, I'm going to go begin with a verse uh, 17. And it says, uh, I'm going to read it first in KJV because I'm a KJV firstist. Uh, and then I'm going to look at it probably in the amplified version. And it says, he is in the way of life that keepeth instruction. But he that refuseth reproof erreth. Well, one thing about Proverbs that I've said numerous times, and it's, it's worth repeating, is that um, what King Solomon is doing in this book of Proverbs, this 31 chapters, is um, he's instructing his son, and of course, this is left for all of us uh, to, in wisdom. And there's a contrast between being wise in life compared to being foolish in life. So throughout this uh, book of Proverbs, you're going to see this. Uh, uh, if you if you are wise, if you understand what is the right things to do, the right ways to live your life. And if you're wise enough to apply those principles to your life, your life will be better. You'll be blessed. You'll be healthier, wealthier, uh, more successful, uh, less problems. Uh, and, but if you are not wise, and rather, rather than wise, you're foolish, then being foolish leads to all kinds of problems in life. And now... Uh, there's things things that are repeated over and over again, like uh, 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 not hanging out with bad people because they'll be a bad influence on you. Uh, not being seduced by uh, a, a seducing woman that wants to lead you into adultery or fornication. Uh, uh, being receptive to teaching. Being... Uh, Having the attitude that you want to learn and you're willing to listen and learn, uh, being willing to be instructed rather than thinking that you already know it all and you know you don't need to listen to anybody. So these are themes that uh, are recurring themes that the Book of Proverbs uh, are repeated. Uh, now, this particular verse here, it's uh, pretty clear what this means right off the bat. He is in the way of life. In other words, you're, you're living life correctly. Um, uh, that keepeth instruction. If, you, if you're willing to listen, if you're willing to be instructed. But he that refuseth reproof, erreth. If, if you will not listen to people okay, who want to correct you, who want to help you, if you're not unwilling to listen to them, now, sometimes people want to correct practice, and we, we should listen to them. But uh, they themselves may be wrong. Uh, so we should be willing to listen, but it doesn't mean that every time someone corrects us that we have to just blindly accept the correction. We need to consider it, with, uh, give it honest evaluation. And that's why later on it's going to talk about how it's wise to have many counselors. Because if a lot of people are telling you the same thing, then uh, it's more reliable than if you just get instruction or correction from one person. Uh, if one person has a criticism of you, 
but universally it's not true. It's not everybody thinks it's the same thing. Then uh, it's probably wise to dismiss that that reproof from that individual because maybe they were either not wise enough to understand the situation, or maybe they have other motivations uh, and they just want to cause a problem and criticize you for for no reason. So, but you should have an attitude. Uh, that you are willing to listen and and don't refuse to be corrected by some by people. Uh, in the Amplified, that verse says, "He who heeds instruction and correction is not only himself in the way of life, but also is a way of life for others." So your life is going to be better. And the people around you, their lives will be better if you are willing to listen to instruction and correction. And he who neglects or refuses reproof, not only himself, but goes astray, but also causes to err and is a path toward ruin for others. So this is saying that if you have an attitude of, um, not willing, being willing to listen to people who are trying to teach you something. Um, if you if you're unwilling to listen to people who are saying, "Hey, I think you're wrong in this. You better rethink what you're doing." Uh, if you're not willing to even listen to them and consider what they're saying, not only will uh, this adversely affect you, but all the people around you will be negatively affected by it too. So. Let's go back now to verse 18 in the KJV. He that hideth hatred with lying lips. He that hideth hatred with lying lips. <laughs> and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. He that hideth hatred. In other words, if you lie and you pretend like you're not hating someone, but you actually do hate them, uh, uh, you're a fool. And, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. Well, um, uh, you know, we've probably all experienced this. We've always, all, always, we've all experienced people who uh, hate us for some reason or another. And uh, uh, I hope you haven't been slandered. I know I've been slandered. And when people want to say uh, uh, false things about you, uh, outright lie or mislead people or when it comes to uh, t telling people about you, uh, you're, uh, then that's slander. And uh, so if you utter, if you're a slanderer, it says you're a fool. Let's look at this in the Amplified, 18. He who hides hatred is of lying lips. Hmm. He who hides hatred is of lying lips. Well, is it saying then that we shouldn't hide our hatred? I, I would hope not. I, I, I think that really looking at scripture as a whole, we, we learn that we should not be even have hatred for people. Um, we may hate things they do. We may hate what they're saying or doing. But for the individual, you know, scriptures tell us to love each other, even love our enemies. So, he who hides hatred is a lying lips. Well, certainly, if you hate someone and you and, and you hide it, you're lying. I'm not sure I really understand that, what the meaning of that is. Um, is this saying that we should not, if we hate, we should not lie about it, should hate openly? I don't think it means that. And he who utters slander is a self-confident fool. All right. Now let's look at verse 19 in the KJV. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. 
in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. In the multitude of words, you know people that just can't stop talking? Scriptures tell us that uh, uh, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Um, Jesus says that some people do not have ears to hear. Uh, they they won't listen. Instead, they want to always do all the talking. And do, do you know anybody who always wants to do all the talking? They're, they're unwilling to listen. That gets old fast. If, if I'm around someone that just wants to talk all the time and is never interested in, in my opinion, in my my reaction to what they're saying, uh, then uh, <laughs> certainly that's not a, a very enjoyable uh, kind of conversation. Conversation is when people take turns talking and listening. When someone's talking, I should be listening. I shouldn't be just formulating what I'm going to say and arguing what my argument against them is going to be. I should actually listen and consider and let it all sink in. I should listen so well that I can repeat back everything they just said. I should try to listen and understand what they're saying so much that I could explain the meaning of what they said. Uh, but if a person's busy talking all the time, uh, they're probably uh, making a big mistake. We should be trying to listen a lot more than we talk. Uh, but he that refrains his lips is wise. Refraining means resist the, the temptation to talk all the time. Instead, try to listen. Let's look at that in the Amplify, verse 19. In a multitude of words, transgression is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is prudent. It's wise to hold back and not be so anxious to talk. Um, I hope, if you're watching this, that you, you will actually consider this. Be, uh, as it said in the first verse, uh, are you someone who will heed instruction? Well, right now we're getting instruction from the scriptures. These are scriptures that God gave King Solomon words of wisdom and one of the things he says to be wise we should be able to be instructed and so right one of the things that we're being instructed on right now is don't be so anxious to talk listen better let's look at verse 20 in the uh, KJV the tongue of the just is as choice as silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. The tongue of the just. The tongue, that means the words. Um, the words, if a person is just, the words that they speak will be like silver. But the heart of the wicked is of little worth. I think that's obvious, but let's look at that in the Amplified, the tongues of those who are upright and in right standing with God are as choice silver. In other words, it's valuable. There's a great value of what they have to say. Someone who is righteous, when they speak, there's value in it. And the, the minds of those who are wicked and out of harmony with God are of little value. Well, it doesn't say of no value at all. I mean, even in a wicked person uh, may have something good to say and maybe it's like that I know that there are people who uh, don't want to listen to someone if they find that they are wrong in one theological realm uh, let's say they're let's say they can even be wrong seriously uh, on, on a core doctrine on the deity of Christ or Salvation by faith alone and and, and, and uh, eternal security. Maybe they're wrong on those one of those things or all of them But that doesn't mean That they might not be right on something else 
So, you know, they say don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, it doesn't mean that someone doesn't have something valuable, something that you can learn, even if they're wicked, even if they're a heretic. In one area, maybe in another subject, they have something of value. Uh, but it's it's unlikely that you're going to learn much from a wicked person. It's a, it says it's of little value what they have to say. Verse 21, the lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for want of wisdom. When it says lips, I think that means words. So the words that the righteous people feed many, that means that people are nourished and gain on their benefit from listening to the words of the righteous. But fools die for want of wisdom. Yeah, without wisdom, you're going to make mistake after mistake after mistake in life. And then uh, you got the law of reaping and sowing. And because of bad decisions and bad actions, you reap bad results in your life, whether it's financial ruin or bad health, bad relationships. Um, let's look at that in Amplify, verse 21. The lips of the uncompromisingly righteous feed and guide many, but fools die for want of understanding and heart. Yes, the lips of the righteous feed and guide many. Feed them because uh, it, it's, it's uh, nourishing to them, to their mind. In their soul, it says that, and, they, and guide many. The lips of the righteous guide many. If people will listen to someone who's wise, who's righteous, then it can be a good guide for you. That's what we're doing with King Solomon. We're, we're listening to him right now. Verse 22 in KJP The blessing of the Lord it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. Verse 22 in Amplified, the blessing of the Lord, it makes truly rich, truly rich. Well, I think that's it's important to have the word truly rich there so that we don't misunderstand and think that rich is just monetary riches. Sometimes a person is rich in other ways besides monetarily. And so what are, what are true riches? Jesus said, don't store up for yourselves, you know, treasures on earth. It's temporary. Uh, instead, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. They're eternal treasures. And th these are the true riches. And, and he adds no sorrow with it. Neither does toiling increase. So the blessing of the Lord is truly rich. The good things God gives us. And he, he has no sorrow with it and toil does not increase. Verse 23 in the KJV, it is a sport to, to a fool to do mischief, but a man of understanding hath wisdom. Mischief. Mischief and fool kind of go together. I know that uh, there's a time in my life where I got into mischief. It was quite foolish. And I, I, you know, I, I suffered some consequences. Some of my friends even suffered greater consequences by being foolish and getting into mischief. And mischief could be something that is uh, kind of minor infractions or even major infractions, like criminal acts, I mean, whether they're they're uh, misdemeanors or felonies. This is mischief, and it's foolishness, and there's consequences. Right? But a man of understanding hath wisdom. Okay. It is, and in Amplified, verse 23 says, it is a, as sport to a self-confident fool. Fools think they know a lot. They're deceiving themselves um, uh, to do wickedness. Oh, they think they're they think they can get away with anything. But God's watching. There will be consequences. 
But to have skillful and godly wisdom is pleasure and relaxation to a man of understanding. To have skill, skillful and godly wisdom is a pleasure and relaxation to a man of understanding. Yeah. Jesus said that don't worry about things. He talks about how even the birds, God feeds the birds, clothes the, the, and the flowers are beautiful. And you know, Don't worry about your clothing, your food, your shelter. God's going to provide what you need. Uh, but if we worry, that's the opposite of relaxation. That's the opposite of faith. It says here that but if you have wisdom, you can have pleasure and relax. You can only relax if you have faith, if you're not worrying. Verse 24 in the KJV. The fear of the wicked, it shall come upon him, but the desire of the righteous shall be granted. Hmm. Yeah, well, the wicked should fear because they're up to no good. And they may be foolish, but they may not be stupid. Uh, stupid means they don't even understand that what they're doing is wrong and that there, are, there, could, have, there cons could be consequences if they get caught. Uh, but foolish means that, well, they know that, but they go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> so... Uh, the fear of the wicked is who come upon you. you know, the, the wicked, they they fear that they're going to be in trouble for their bad actions, and sure enough, it's going to happen. They're not going to escape the consequences. Um, but the desire of the righteous shall be granted. God says that uh, desire the Lord with all your heart. And, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I think I got the first part of that wrong. It says that God will give you the desires of your heart. And uh, here it says, but the desire of the righteous shall be granted. Well, I think that uh, if, the, if you're righteous, you probably have righteous desires. And if your desires are righteous, then God's going to grant them. Uh, if your desires are not righteous, and God will probably say no and not grant it. Um, let's look at verse 24 in the KJV. No, 25, I mean. Uh, As the whirlwind passeth, so is the wicked no more. But the righteous is an everlasting foundation. We'll see that in the Amplified. When the whirlwind passes, the wicked are no more. So, when you're wicked, yeah, your life is in a whirlwind. You're not relaxed. You can't have peace because being wicked and foolish, there's always going to be uh, worry because you're up to no good. <laughs> and you're worried about getting caught. And sure enough, you will. And uh, so it's referred to as a whirlwind. Uh, but the, the righteous have an everlasting foundation. The righteous have an everlasting foundation. Mm -hmm. and our, who is our foundation? Our foundation is Jesus Christ. The Christ in Christ is my foundation. Um, Verse 26 in the KJV, a, as vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. Okay, so here's introducing a new uh, problem, uh, a new form of foolishness. It's foolish to be a sluggard, and a sluggard is a lazy person. Uh, so he says, as vinegar to the teeth, so vinegar is irritating to the teeth, Smoke is irritating the eyes, and, and so is the sluggard 
to them that send him. So if you send someone lazy off to do something, it's not going to get done. It's just going to be irritating. And verse 26 in the Amplified, as vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the slugger to those who employ and send him. So if you're an employer, do not hire someone who's lazy. Do not keep them. It's just going to be disappointment and, and, and upsetting to you because this lazy person is not going to do what they're supposed to do. And 27 in the KJV, the fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Well, yeah, most I would say that most wicked people probably have much shorter lives. They either die because of uh, drinking themselves to death or drug abuse or, or violence, being caught up in violence and, and, uh, or foolishness where they're being, acting crazy, driving recklessly and end up killing themselves and others. There's these, these um, the wicked people, the foolish people, uh, probably not lived to be a real, have a real long life. But if you have the fear of the Lord, if you respect the Lord, and you have wisdom, then you can probably expect a longer life for the most part. Uh, you know, good habits give you good uh, good results in life. You've got good health habits, you're healthier. There's exceptions to the rule, but most of the time it's true that uh, if you have, you have the fear of the Lord, if you respect the Lord, and you read the scriptures, and you listen, you follow the proverbs, and you live your life. And in a wise way, you're going to probably have a longer, healthier, more blessed life. Um, Twenty-seven in the Amplified is the reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord prolongs one's days, but the years of the wicked sh shall be made short. Twenty-eight in the KJV, the hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness. So, if you're righteous and you hope for something, you'll be glad because your hopes and your prayers will be answered. Sometimes God answers the prayers, though, in a way that we don't really want. Uh, I believe God does it answer all prayers. He, he hears all prayers and he answers them. Uh, but sometimes for our own good, he says no. Because we may be praying for something and God knows that that's not really the best thing for us. And, uh, and, and sometimes he, he doesn't say yes or no. He says, wait. Okay, you can do it. Uh, this, this is good. But this is not the right time. God knows better. So he always answers our prayers. Sometimes we get an immediate yes, sometimes an immediate no, and sometimes wait. But this is the hope of the righteous. That's the hope or the prayers, the desires of the righteous shall be gladness. Okay, we will be glad. Uh, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. So if you're wicked, you've done wicked and foolish things then uh, the things that you want, uh, your goals, even if you attain them temporarily, they will perish. And let's look at 29, that the way of the Lord is strength to the upright, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. The way of the Lord. So the way of the Lord means that we read the scriptures, and try to live according to what the scriptures tell us. It, if we do that, uh, is strength and upright. And but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. So if you're evil, you're a worker of iniquity, then you know you can expect destruction. You can expect bad consequences. Uh, verse thirty: The righteous shall never be removed but the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, the righteous, we know the righteous, those people who put their faith in Jesus uh, and uh, are promised eternal life in the kingdom of God. And the scriptures tell us that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, that a lot of people think that the eternal, and if you go to heaven in eternity, that is some ethereal, non spatial, non physical realm. But the scriptures really tell us no, that. We will be on a new earth, uh, and it'll be perfect uh, as it was. But in the original creation, before the fall, but even better, and and that's we will be able to live forever on earth. And it says that the the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. Where will they be? Well, they will die, and then they will be resurrected, and then they will be judged, and they will be found. Lacking what will they lack? They lack faith in Jesus which give, gives them eternal life immortality Since they didn't receive eternal life by believing in Jesus They're not immortal and they die and they go into the lake of fire this which is called the second death And so now we got verse 31 The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom, but the froward tongue shall be cut out yeah, Froward is uh, just a disagreeable type of a person. Let's look at that in the Amplified, verse 31. The mouths of the righteous, that's those harmonious with God, bring forth skillful and godly wisdom. But the perverse tongue shall be cut down like a barren and rotten tree. So over and over we, we're, we should hope we're, we're learning this message that um, if we're righteous, now we get righteousness imputed to us uh, when we put our faith in Jesus. Uh, it, what happens is there, there's a transaction. Uh, all of our sins and iniquity are charged against Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay for those sins. And, and by believing in Jesus, the, his perfect righteousness is transferred over to us. We get credit for his righteousness. So in the sight of God, we're sinless and righteous and perfect uh, and so um, uh, it says that the mouth that's what the righteous is the mouth of the righteous we get righteous by putting our faith in Jesus and then we practice our righteousness by studying the scriptures by praying and and, and studying the scriptures and, and having the Holy Spirit of God, which lives inside everyone who believes in Jesus, transforming us. You know, the scripture says, do not be conformed to the, to the, uh, uh, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the Holy Spirit living, who lives in every believer is transforming us, renewing our mind, and so that we can do righteous and live righteous things. I mean, live, live a righteous life and do righteous deeds. And by doing that, uh, we live, uh, we bring forth skillful and godly wisdom. But the perverse tongue shall be cut down. So, um, as says, like a barren and rotten tree. Uh, verse 32, the last verse in first the KJV, the lips of the righteous know what is acceptable. But the Mouth of the wicked speaketh frowardness. How do we know what is acceptable? Well, there's two things, two ways of knowing. One way, and the most important way, is we go to the scriptures. The scriptures tell us how to live our lives. They tell us what to believe. They tell us who Jesus is, uh, who, why we need to believe in him. Uh, how, how to live our lives and so that's where we go for instructions some people said that the Bible is the owner's manual for for our lives so uh, we go to the scriptures but we also have another source of guidance and that's the Holy Spirit that lives in every believer but uh, I've been concerned about some people that uh, rather than testing the spirits by the scriptures People, some people 
say that the spirit told them something. Well, maybe, maybe a spirit's telling you something, but is it the Holy Spirit? Because we we have a spiritual battle going on, and uh, the forces of uh, evil uh, are trying to first they want to prevent someone from even coming to Jesus and getting salvation, and, and if they fail at that, they want to they want to prevent you from growing, maturing, and serving in your ministry for Jesus. Uh, so, um, the um, the idea of, um, of um, getting our information from a spirit you know, always has to be uh, tested by the scriptures. And uh, I said this once before, but what if I have two friends? And they both tell me that the spirit spoke to them, and they both tell me opposite opposing messages that they contradict each other. Well, obviously, they can't both be from the Holy Spirit. Maybe neither one's from the Holy Spirit. How do we how do we find out if what we're getting from the Holy Spirit is true? We go to the scriptures and compare and see if see if it conforms to the scriptures. Let's look at this last verse in the, in the Amplified. The lips of the uncompromisingly righteous know and therefore utter what is acceptable. But the mouth of the wicked knows and therefore speaks only what is obstinately willful and contrary. All right, so there you have it. The completion of uh, chapter 10, Book of Proverbs. Um, I, I want to make sure that uh, before I close this uh, study here that um, I cover the most important subject of the Bible, and that is uh, what do you have to do so that you can have eternal life in heaven? Uh, that's the most important question that you will ever have to address in your life. Um, and that question was asked to the Apostle Paul by a jailer in a, in a, in a, called the Philippian jailer. And he asked Paul, what do I have to do so I can go to heaven? What do I have to do? The way he phrases, what must I do to be saved? That's probably the most direct, best question that you could ask right now. I, if, if you are not saved, if you're not certain that you're going to go to heaven and you don't know what the Bible says about how we get there, what we must do, and that's the question of utmost importance to you right now. And the answer Paul gave the Philippian jailer was very simple. There was not a, uh, you know, uh, an essay. It wasn't a dissertation. He didn't have to spend 20 minutes explaining it to him. He said one sentence. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Isn't that wonderful? It's that simple. It's that simple to be saved and receive eternal life in heaven. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to believe on him? It means you depend on him. Believing on Jesus means that you're not trying to get to heaven through your own effort. That's what people around the world today and throughout history have always done. They, they think that they kind of climb a ladder up and work their way up to heaven. And if they try hard enough, do good enough, they can get to heaven on their own merit. But the Bible says that no one can succeed that way. They, you will all fall short. You'll never be able to do it. And... Uh, so that's why Paul told him. He didn't say you have to work really hard to be righteous, you have to really do a lot of good things, you have to join a religion, become a religious person, and follow religious rules, and give to charity, and light candles, and confess to your priest, and pray five times a day on a rug. Paul didn't say any of those things. Now, if those things were required and Paul did not include them, then the Apostle Paul would have to be either a liar 
or he would have to be negligent. But he wasn't a liar, and he wasn't negligent. He's the, uh, the greatest evangelist of all history. Uh, and he told the man exactly what he needed to know. He said, believe on Jesus. Depend on Jesus. Trust Jesus. Rely on Jesus. Don't try to do it on your own. Instead, rely on Jesus, and he'll get you to have your faith in him. Now, I want you to know who he is and what he did and why you can trust him. The Bible says Jesus is God who came down from heaven and became a man named Jesus. And he, Jesus said the reason he did, came down and became a man was so he could give his life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone free. That's what he did. He, he died on a cross to pay for your sins as a ransom. So your sins are paid for. Scripture says that he's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. He paid for the sins of the whole world. So you should be really, really happy now to know that Jesus has already died for all your sins. So sin is not a barrier preventing you from being with God. Jesus paid for the sin. You can come to Jesus now. Um, but you've got to do it in faith, no longer believing in something else, like some religion or your own abilities, your own performance. No longer believing that. Instead, now you come to Jesus believing in him entirely. So he died for your sins. That's problem solved. Now, do you want to receive eternal life? Come, put your faith in him. He will give you eternal life. He promises it to everyone who believes in him. And uh, there's, a, there's a good reason to believe in him. It's, I'm not asking you to do this based upon blind faith. Jesus, Jesus was asked by the Jewish religious leaders to give a sign to prove his claims. He claimed to be God. He claimed to be Satan. And he to, they demanded a sign. He says, the only sign I want to give you is the sign of Jonah. And as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He was like, talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. He died on the cross. He was in the tomb, buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead. He said he would raise himself from the dead as a sign to prove he's God and he does have the power over life and death. And there were hundreds and hundreds of witnesses who saw him and touched him and spoke with him and ate with him. So because of the resurrection, you can feel confident in putting your faith in Jesus. Your faith in Jesus is justified because of that resurrection. So put your faith in Jesus now. Jesus said that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke means that when you are joined together, when you put your faith in Jesus, you embrace him and he embraces you and he got you like that. Scripture says that he had, Jesus has you in the palm of his hand. And it says no one can pluck you out. And, and, and even if even if you have doubts and lose faith, he, he, Scripture says, when we have no faith, He remains faithful. He He will never leave you and forsake you. It says He He remains faithful he, because He cannot deny Himself. He promises you that He's giving you eternal life because you put your faith in Him, and He cannot deny Himself or break that promise. So once you put your faith in Jesus. You're yoked to him for eternity. And he said, my burden is light. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. The only burden he puts on us is, he said, well, you love each other. He says, I condemn everything, all commandments, all rules and regulations and everything about life. Just, just do this one thing for me. Love each other. So, to get yoked to Jesus, we simply must believe in him. And then after that, the only 
the only burden on us is just love each other. Sometimes it's hard to love each other, but try. All right, thank you for watching, and I'll start chapter 11 uh, next, uh, uh, next Wednesday. Thank you for watching, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.